So good evening, everyone. Uh, we're ready to start. So uh, let me begin by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Professor Peter Edwards, and I'm Vice Principal for Regional Engagement here at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, and it gives me very great pleasure to welcome you all to the 2022 Watt Hepburn Lecture. Um, a little bit about the history of the lecture series. Uh, it was established in 2013, following a, a very generous donation from the late Anne Sants. Um, Anne was a, a graduate of this university in the 1940s and was the daughter of William Watt Hepburn. Uh, and William was an Aberdeen businessman who at the time was described as one of the most successful entrepreneurs of his generation. Uh, to give you some idea, his diverse business interests included textile mills, a fertilizer plant, uh, a chain of restaurants, uh, and many others. Um, he died in, in 1953, and this lecture series, with its focus on entrepreneurship and business, serves as a lasting tribute to his business acumen. So tonight, we're delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Ewan Venters. Uh, Ewan is Chief Executive Officer of International Art Gallery, Hauser & Wirth, and the hospitality company, Art Farm. Uh, previously, he was CEO of Fortnum & Mason, who, who happened to produce my favorite tea, Royal Blend, uh, just a quick plug. Um, and prior to that, was a member of the executive team at Selfridges. In his current role, he oversees a host of properties and venues uh, and galleries around the globe. Uh, and perhaps for, for us here in the Northeast, uh, most notable amongst those is the award-winning Fife Arms in Braemar. So tonight's event um, will be starting in a moment, and it will take the form of a short lecture by Ewan, followed by a Q&A session chaired by my colleague Lindsay Tibbetts from the Business School. So all that remains for me to say now is to thank you again for joining us this evening, and I'd like to invite Ewan to come up and give the 2022 Watt Hepburn Lecture. Thank you. I hope I have a lecture. Uh, I'll keep it as short as I possibly can. Uh, I hope, uh, like, like all uh, good conversations, uh, ultimately, I think uh, the value will be in the question and answer. So um, please, no, no questions uh, off limits. Um, so I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about, about my story, about how I got uh, to where I am today, the challenges I faced, and how I am working to build a better future for the young people who, frankly, uh, are, are our future, our future workers, our future managers, and, of course, our future leaders. After all, our youth, our young people, are the ones who will drive greater success for our beautiful country. And if we can develop their skills, keep them employed, engaged, and motivated in the towns and cities they call home, that is, especially in the rural areas where work and accommodation are not so easy to come by. And after all of that, um, where is there for them to do? What is there for them to do after work? Where is there for them to go to be entertained, to socialize and to thrive? As you've just heard, I'm the chief executive of the International Contemporary Art Gallery, Haus & Wirth. It was founded in Switzerland. Uh, it built its reputation for the last 30 years on its dedication to artists and support for visionary artistic projects around the globe. It's a family business with a true global outlook, with outposts in a myriad of jurisdictions, including London, Somerset, Hong Kong, New York, Monaco, Menorca, Los Angeles, and soon to be in Paris. What are we passionate about? Well, we are passionate about our people and the people that we serve and support. After all, without people, there is simply no business. We invest in art, in academia, in scholarship, and research. And after the formation of Art Farm, 
in 2014, which brings about art into hospitality to create a truly unique blend of accommodation and the highest quality food and drink in an art-led environment. I have to say I am rather humbled to be in the spotlight at Aberdeen University tonight, which obviously boasts a very proud and very long history. And in fact, your founder and I, in a way, have a few things in common. We are both travellers who have found ourselves in Aberdeen and the area, and indeed are establishing new opportunities here and within the region. My own formal uh, education achievements ended when I decided at the very last minute that university wasn't for me. Or perhaps it's more accurate to say that I don't think I was the right candidate for university at that time. And so I entered into the world of work. In a way, I was rather lucky in some respects. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and I was laser-focused on that ambition. And not often people are, have the good fortune to know exactly their direction of travel and passion so young in life. I launched my entrepreneurial journey and, in fact, my love of food, really, by making and selling bread rolls, cakes and tablet, which I'm sure needs no explanation here in Aberdeen, at the age of 11 from my parents' kitchen in Fife. I figured that you're never too young to gain that entrepreneurial bug. Every weekend, I delivered um, bread rolls to the local neighborhood. It started quite simple, but it grew to something quite special. I ended up employing maybe five or six people by the time I was 16. And by then, I really had developed a huge hunger for business. And it was the only challenge I truly wanted to pursue. There was, frankly, no other path in life for me. It was always going to be focused on business, on retail, and in particular, at that time, the food and drink industry. The drive, the excitement, the, the pressure, the passion, it really speak to me as an individual. So, at the princely age of 17, I became a management trainee for Sainsbury's in London, a city I knew rather well from the many journeys to the capital with my parents growing up, where we would all go and, 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 and enjoy the great delights of the theatre and museums once or twice a year in London. London, as it were, became my siren call. It lured me in, and I fell in love with the city very quickly, uh, very early on in my journey. I suppose I, I really did think that the streets were paved with gold. I can still remember to this day that smell of the diesel trains as I arrived into King's Cross Station. That atmosphere, that memory, that latent smell in the nostrils that is still there, even although I think some of the trains are electric, you know, but still sort of is there when I travel back to the capital uh, by rail to this very day. I climbed the ranks of Sainsbury's over uh, the decade I was there and eventually became what was known as the citrus buyer. Can you imagine? A buyer just for citrus fruits uh, for their huge retailing operations. It was, it was an amazing job being the citrus buyer. I traveled the world. I was, I was the young man from Del Monte, if you remember those other. <laughs> At the time, I was buying nearly 200 million pounds worth of citrus for the Sainsbury Group, which is 25 years ago now. And when I think back, I had the audacity to launch a ready peeled orange to make it easier to eat an orange. Can you imagine taking this beautiful orange skin of an orange and putting it in a plastic container? You would be hung out to dry now if you did that sort of thing. I was also the first buyer uh, at Sainsbury who managed to sell a million pounds worth of citrus in one day alone in the run-up to Christmas. From Sainsbury's, I joined the food supplier Breaks in my first executive role and held a, a series of, uh, of appointments as we expanded our sales across restaurants and catering businesses before I was approached by the Weston family who wanted me to take charge of the food offering at the most glamorous of stores on London's Oxford Street, the world-famous Selfridges. Now, working for one of the planet's most recognisable brand names was quite unbelievable, and I thrived in such a positive environment, embracing the culture 
learning so much and helping to take the brand to a new level. Take our foothold at that time, it, it just simply lacked love before I joined. And I was very fortunate to have some fantastic owners who were willing to support my plans with strong capital investment. We built a fantastic team, a great team, sourced the very best products, and created lots of theater and lots of great energy. It changed beyond recognition. From there, I went on to develop the e-commerce business uh, for the entire Selfridges uh, group, helping to form its, its future. At the time, I really saw that the writing was on the wall for a business that didn't adapt to the changing retail climate and that wasn't, at the time, embracing the digital world. We entered the digital fray, as many of our competitors did, and we could see that that, that, that direction of travel was what our customers desired. We had a very global customer base, so the chance for, for those consumers to either shop in person or shop online or shop more appropriately in a mixture of both was an essential ingredient. For the organization at the time, it meant that we could not only just tap into domestic customers who might want the convenience of shopping from home, but an international market that may have crossed our threshold on a previous visit, but were by that point back home in the United States, the Middle East, or Asia. The internet truly gave us uh, access to a global marketplace. Now, as a consequence, that and many other things we did, we ended up being named the best department store in the world several times by our peers. Having, love, having, having developed a love of high-end department store retailing, where everything is under one roof, I was then approached by uh, another arm of the very same Western family that took me to Selfridges. And so with that, I joined the world-renowned Queen's grocer, Fortnum and Mason. Here, this brand with huge heritage, huge significance, and huge retailing history throughout the world for over 300 years was an extraordinary business, but perhaps a business that wasn't particularly relevant to uh, many people, certainly in the UK. It was drawing lots on, on foreign visitors, and many of whom thought that the Queen might be shopping there at any given moment. In fact, I always remember being stopped often on the shop floor and asked one of two popular questions. One was, where is the loos? Where are the bathrooms? And the second, um, does the Queen really shop here? And I would turn quickly and say, well, do you know you've just missed her? she just left by the Duke Street doors. So one of, my number one objective was uh, to make the business attractive to people living in London, its core customer base, and indeed consumers throughout the UK. Our mantra became, let's be more relevant to more people more often. We wanted domestic consumers to see our value and our quality. Uh, I, I, and I've always believed that people must see that they're getting great value in anything that I've ever done. We want consumers to, to, to buy into what, uh, what can be seed, conceived as something of great quality where there's no waste where it can be consumed or it can be worn or it can be held for an extended period of time and it isn't something that just disintegrates once you bought it. So, for example, a beef of rib might cost, at Fortnum's might cost something in the round of £80 and it would feed six people. But there wasn't any waste because the quality of the meat was so good that people perceived, therefore, that there was great value for money for spending those few extra pounds. Yes, we were a business full of expensive gifts and beautiful treats, but we also had an amazing, an amazing array of offerings that made us the local store for Londoners. And I think we eventually became known as the biggest and the best corner shop in the world. One of our achievements that I was deeply proud of the team was that 72% of all of the products sold at Fortnum's were made here in the United Kingdom. And in fact, over 50 of the suppliers were from Scotland. So Scotland and its manufacturing base were a very important dynamic in the success of the Fortnum & Mason business. I think some people thought that royal warrants were just a badge of honor. Uh, and, but that royal family actually does need to spend money in your business to not only receive, but to retain a warrant. 
I like to think that we were frankly so good at what we did that the royal family wanted to shop with us. And that gives people all over the world a reason to come and buy from us too. During my tenure, we tripled the size of the business. We saw profit before tax rise from 1 million per annum to 12 million per annum between 2012 and 2019. We opened new stores at Heathrow Airport, at St Pancras Station in London, at, in Hong Kong. And we engaged in a variety of tactics and activities, including working with artists, to bring a completely new dynamic to the Piccadilly store. One of those such artists was an extraordinary man, Chinese man called uh, Zhang Enli, who um, indeed, in fact, represented uh, by Hausenwerth as one of the hundred or so artists that we represent. We worked with Zhang Enli to bring about new customers and to create a challenging proposition and perception of the business as we uh, 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 went on our journey of recreating the, how the brand was viewed. Now, the luxury retail world and the art world may seem entirely different, but there is actually a common thread of excellence in both industries. And in the business sense, it's about running a professional, sustainable business. So my move to House and Worth wasn't as radical or as big a shift as some might have expected it to be. It was helpful that I knew Ivan and Manuela Worth, our owners, so my recruitment involved no headhunters. I had, in fact, known them for several years, and we sort of clicked and we really got on very well. And that personal connection and that ability to be able to engage with the right people and build a strong team, a warm professional relationship, I believe, is absolutely critical in business. The old adage, it's not what you know, it's who you know, might be a bit of an exaggeration, but business is all about people and relationships, both internally and externally. And these are critical factors if you're going to succeed at almost any level. Now, what they wanted was not a new art person to add another layer to that dimension. They already had great expertise and great knowledge, but they wanted someone from a different sector to bring in new approaches and tactics that could take the business in a different direction and ensure we evolved to another level. I started a much more digital focus to help the business advance and embrace the 21st century, engaging with a whole new generation of art collectors, without, of course, abandoning the core clientele who like to see their art in person and feel and engage with it. This approach, of course, is not contradictory. In fact, I call it fidgetal. It's a fidgetal world. It's a world where you can blend both digital and physical to both our uh, clients and our fans of art alike. So with many people now wanting to engage online, we can do live viewings and communications with curators and experts as they see uh, their art on screen in front of them. That seems to be a significant step forward in making life easier for most of us. Yet, art fairs continue to be a big draw for collectors who want the tangible in front of them. Since the pandemic, we've seen people return to exhibitions, galleries, and shows as they crave interaction, not only with the artists, but with the experts, other collectors, and of course, friends across the sector. It's clear the world is changing fast, and of course, we must adapt with it. One of the key factors I also felt was very important as part of embracing that change from the retail sector was embracing that of the sustainability question. Now, perhaps it's not something you'd automatically assume the art world uh, would uh, connect with. I think art world tends to conjure up images of, of largest, but I was clear that bringing responsibility for our carbon footprint and our impact upon the environment was an unequivocal sign of our responsibility to the planet, our communities, our clients, and of course, our artists. This is why one of my first decisions was to appoint a global head of environmental sustainability. We are probably the only commercial art gallery in the world to do so. 
and we've committed to target a reduction of our emissions by 50% by 2030 in line with the Paris Agreement. This is a serious goal, a serious mission, and not so easy to achieve. However, we are making great success, and I can say now that we're already one third of the way towards that target. So it is exciting and deeply motivating to see the progress that we make. Ivan Manuela and I are completely focused on this. It's our responsibility to our fellow global citizens. We believe that as an employer, as a member of our communities, and as a custodian, not only of our art, but our buildings, our bases, and simply to look after one another. We have a, a huge role to play, but we, we, uh, of course, but we want to help lighten, light the way for other people, be a good neighbour and make places we live and, and work better for as many people as we can, and indeed share that knowledge for the benefit of the wider sector. Now, that's not to say we get this right all the time, and we are a business that needs to make, like most businesses, a return on investment. But we do uh, need to do it responsibly and leave behind a deep and lasting legacy for future generations. Look at what we're doing here in the northeast of Scotland, in Braemar and in Ballater in particular. The Worth spot a beautiful hotel, the Five Arms, which sits in some of the most spectacular landscape on the planet and have truly embraced their goal of making art available to be appreciated by all. So we have works by Picasso on display, watercolours by Queen Victoria and His Majesty King Charles III, a portrait by Lucien Freud, a sumptuous ceiling created by that incredible Chinese artist I refer to, Zhang Enli, to name just a few. We want to encourage as wide an audience as possible to enjoy art in all its forms. Wherever we lay our hats, and we set out our stall, whether that be our new pub and restaurant in London's Mayfair, the Audley, or our plans for the second property that we've acquired in Braemar, the Invercold Arms. We want to make these stunning environments and places where our guests can relax and engage with art close up like they may never have done before. But we're also about creating real beauty in its own right, as art as part of our developments. Just watch what emerges at the Invercold Arms in the next few years, which will be a legacy for generations to come and provide facilities for locals and visitors alike, which I hope will be second to none. We firmly believe in the power of art, food, and community. Early next year, we will open a fish shop and a fishmonger, uh, uh, in uh, Ballater to provide even more for locals and visitors alike from utilising the best Scottish produce and highlighting that to our global, our local and our global visitors. As others contract and withdraw, we want to expand, enhance and enhance all our offerings. We're working with local traders, entrepreneurs and service people to ensure that they are supported with our investment. We want to support and sustain, to, to ensure sustainability is on our doorstep, but is also here in Aberdeen, in Edinburgh, on the west coast of Scotland, and acro across this splendid country. We want to support our neighbours and all that can help, all those people that can help make things better in our communities. And we're giving back with the support of His Majesty the King. He was so ahead of his time, as we know, regarding the mantra of sustainability and ensuring communities get regeneration support. They need to make those communities viable for future generations. His Majesty often calls it heritage-led regeneration. He sees the need to revive lost skills and trades that may well have fallen out of favour. So our own journey is working hand in glove with His Majesty and his team. And I have genuine pleasure and honour of being a trustee of the Prince's Foundation, formed by King Charles in 2018 and based at Dumfries House in Ayrshire. 
which works on a holistic approach to some of these great sustainability and development challenges. And we all want, led by His Majesty, to bring back the amazing talents shown by stonemasons, by blacksmiths, by farmers and thatchers, as well as those in hospitality, the arts, dying skills that aren't lost forever, but instead should be protected for our future developments and given to a new generation to embrace and thrive with. All the trustees of the foundation believe in the need to work in a, com in a complementary way with our natural environment and the surroundings we find ourselves in. The work we undertake establishes communities that are sustainable and sympathetic to their place in the world, and most importantly, to the people who live and work in them, using skills that have been around for generations. These are practical skills that can be brought to life in a new era. Why shouldn't we have the best hospitality professionals in the world, or people who can repair thatch roofs, or blacksmiths taking their talents globally. Heritage, paying respect to the past, but embracing the future, and all the advantages that brings, is a key driver for the king, and it's something that I wholeheartedly support as a proud and humble trustee of the foundation. And we try to adopt in our own projects at Art Farm and within the wider Hauser and Worth family. I think it's fair to say, and I, I feel proud to say this here in Scotland, that we've all somewhat been blown away, I think, by His Majesty the King's fortitude and grace following the very sad passing of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. He's clearly making his own mark and showing that his legacy should be for the UK, the Commonwealth, the wider world, and I'm tremendously proud to play my own small part in that. My own journey to date in retail has all been about getting there. The ride has been magnificent so far, and I've been given extraordinary opportunities and chances that I don't think I could ever possibly imagined as that 11 or 12-year-old boy sitting making tablets in my mum's kitchen in Fife. All roads at that time led to London, but my heart and much now of our investments are here in Scotland. So I genuinely want to help build its future to nurture the next generation and to help them achieve their dreams and goals. But we don't want to lose them. We don't want to lose them to Central Belt's gain, to London's gain or, indeed, Warbetida's to nations outside our shores. We should be embracing the massive potential and making sure that we love, we love it, we train it, and we set free to lead us into the future. We're spending, as an organisation, huge sums of money in Scotland. To date, more than £35 million uh, has been spent, and a further 35 million will be spent in Deeside. But we do it despite often the lack of direct and tangible support and partnership. Sure, we have people praising us, lauding us, and offering us assistance. But when the chips are down, when we seek help and practical solutions, that that offer is sometimes wanting that support not available, and that we're left our own devices to find solutions to problems not necessarily of our making, but which hinder our task in hand. We have wonderful benefactors who have made their main home here in the north of Scotland. They love Bramar as much as anyone, and they want its young people and the other talent from around the globe to come here and make it their home for themselves and for future generations. We have the natural environment as a siren call, but we need more than simply beauty and landscape and jobs. We need infrastructure. We need 5G that works in all nooks and crannies of the area, fiber optic broadband that is robust and strong. Our clients, our customers, and indeed our young employees expect nothing less. I read just this morning, very sadly, that uh, the, the, the broadband budget uh, by the Scottish Government has been cut by £16 million 
£1,000. Not a great moment to be uh, making a plea for more when it's just been cut. But if you come from New York, from Texas, from California, and you can't make a phone call or Google interesting places to visit, it can be simply very frustrating. We must be a truly global village. Our guests and visitors want transport networks that work for them, that are integrated so that when they fly, they know that they can make a swift and efficient connection to Braemar. A handful of buses each day just doesn't cut it. We'd like our leaders, not just politicians, but CEOs of transport companies, the entrepreneurs with a view on these things, the genius inventors to help make rural Scotland a testbed for new forms of transport that allow you to connect with the world swiftly and seamlessly. And we are prepared to put our money where our mouth is this evening. If there are innovative schemes that enable people to call a bus to meet them when they need it rather than stand in the rain and wait for one, or an app that allows young people to get safe, quick, affordable transport to and from work or home or to the airport whenever they need it, then we will be here to support, guide and embrace those ideas. We want to become a town that's a, a, a technolo technological leader with innovation ideas that make the northeast of Scotland an integrated, efficient, caring and easy place to live and work. But with that, we also need practical help from those people in political and administration power who can get things done to facilitate our journey, to create jobs, to create wealth, and become a global draw for hospitality, art, creative debate, and leadership. We simply want to be an epicenter for the new artistic enlightenment. In the last few months, We've hosted great minds like the Astronomer Royal, the Chief Executive of Virgin Galactic, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the innovator of a new jet engine powered by hydrogen, a Nobel Laureate, neuroscientist, wonderful jungle explorers, and former Secretary Generals of NATO. Our goal is to inspire debate, share ideas, new thinking, to put Bremar on the map for being the global centre for thought leadership and inspirational advancement. We've had the brightest and the best authors at our inaugural literary festival, which was held in collaboration with Her Majesty the Queen Consort's Reading Room, a hub for literature, literature communities around the world celebrating literature in all its forms. We had the greatest chefs and food writers, the likes of Tom Parker Bowles, Angela Hartnett, and Dundee-born chef Jeremy Lee plus the novelist Sebastian Folks, the great Ian Rankin, or I think probably should call him Sir Ian, uh, all in Braemar at the Braemar Literary Festival. We can and do draw some of the most recognisable names in the United Kingdom and beyond to come to our home to speak to hundreds of excited guests. Our goal? To engender new thought to bring the brightest and the most inspiring people to decide, to excite, to engage, and to create new ambition for young and not-so-young people uh, across the region and all of the region's leaders. Of course, our remote location is one of our biggest draws, and the breathtaking scenery, much of which I think is being, being played behind me, uh, is quite exceptional. The isolation, the peace is what people come to enjoy. But we also want to be connected and looking not at what competitors in Aberdeen or Dundee are doing, but what similar operations in New York and Paris and Milan are offering. In a sense, they are our competition. And we're not just expecting governments of, uh, of whatever background or level simply to turn up and lavish cash on us. Although... From time to time, we would like a little support with our 70 million plus investment. But we want partnership with all sectors, from our friends, our competitors in the hospitality and the tourism sector, to government, to those amazing people who do so much uh, for so little in return. We're keen, for example, on creating a hospitality 
training centre of excellence in the area to ensure that we remain that we remain among the great epicentres for creative food and drink anywhere in the world. We have an appetite, pardon the pun, to work alongside other interested parties in the sector to build a passion for the next generation who will come to help showcase their talent and our natural excellence in produce and quality food to entice travellers from around the world. And we want our customers and clients to be able to come and enjoy that facility. It should be a multifaceted offering that appeals to locals, to visitors, and the talented chefs in front of house and other staff as they begin their journey in the profession that is far too often considered a stopgap before you find a proper role in life. Given our astonishing food and drink offering, our staggering scenery and hospitality, we should be as proud to work serving customers from around the world as the French are, as the Italians, as the Americans. But our search for training facility needs partners and the right environment, including, not always, but the perfect building environment, the perfect support system, to make this dream with our financial backing become a reality. I do sometimes worry that we're just a little too quick for Scotland, that she's slower than the nation that I left behind age 17, that the country isn't up to speed with the entrepreneurial passion that not only myself, Ivan Manuela, have for this nation, but so many other entrepreneurs. Some of you may have read a report in the Times just a couple of weeks ago that highlighted just how few patents were filed in Scotland compared to England and other comparable nations in the rest of Europe. Why are we falling behind? What's become of the innovative nation that I was born into and dearly love? We must allow space and environment for that innovation. We must discover new ways of thinking to support entrepreneurs and investors and not become a nation too prepared to say no to new concepts and investment. And it's not just about business. We want to break the mould in terms of our social engagement too. As I've said, Ivan and Manuela love this country with a passion and want to be here for many years to come. They want, they want to support their community, the D side that has made them feel so welcome and so at home. We know our community is a little isolated geographically, but that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't be uh, uh, isolated from critical support. So for example, and this is a real example, we offered to pay for an ambulance for the wider Braemar community that, will, that uh, will, uh, the community will financially support a crew and be sustained for years to come. We, needed, we need a dedicated vehicle for our community, which also means the pressure is alleviated on other towns and villages in the region. As well as Braemar benefiting, the other areas, of course, from Aberdeen to Bankery and beyond, would benefit as we alleviate the need for the resource to be pooled to our town when required. But our conversations with the Scottish Ambulance Service have been long, fraught, and downright difficult. This is not about privatisation or about taking resource away from others. In fact, it's quite the contrary. This is a way of giving back, of supporting our friends, our neighbours, our colleagues, should they, God forbid, ever need emergency support. We want nothing in return. No say in operations, no sway over the crew, no input into training or service. We just want to make sure that our community is fully served by trained paid for and manned should that personnel need the ambulance service. Isn't that value of community support? Couldn't that be a template for other rural communities? So that those who can afford to take the strain should do so. There will be obstacle, obstacles and issues to overcome for sure, but that means that those communities that can't afford to pay for their own are guaranteed cover by taking the strain from others that can. We don't want, nor should we get, 
preferential treatment. We don't want to jump the queue. We don't want to go to private hospitals. We just want to know that when an emergency occurs, we have an ambulance that doesn't have to come from Aberdeen, or worse, with all of the ramifications that that entails. When Aberdeen communities uh, must face waits over the prescribed limit of eight minutes, then you can imagine just how bad that can be in Bremar. If we had a vehicle to service, the benefits for us and for Aberdeen and elsewhere, I think, are very clear. Surely that's a positive. Why can't that philanthropic approach apply elsewhere in Scotland? We have, after all, been the most philanthropic of nations throughout our history. We gave the world untold, untold good and enlightenment, and now we want to help our own communities too. This could be replicated in so many other areas that are lacking. Good people supplementing the services we too often expect overstretched governments to provide. And let's be honest, governments are going to find it increasingly difficult to provide what they even offer now, let upon, let upon pick up the tab for even more expensive services. But our offer has been met with suspicion and obstacles. We have no agenda other than the desire to help others and alleviate pressure and stress. We claim to be a nation wanting to be different and caring for others in the 21st century. So let us do it and be brave and visionary in our approach. Let's share the burden with those who can afford it. It's frustrating to see that a time that this country needs to be seen to be innovative, forward-thinking and entrepreneurial, it seems slow to react, struggling to get the basic building blocks in, space, in place and suspicious of anyone who doesn't approach things in the usual, often bureaucratic manner. And this isn't about politics with a capital P. You know, we have no persuasion or colour. We just simply want the best for Scotland and its people. We want to work with a government of any political hue that can see the benefits of investment. That also doesn't mean that they should roll over and do as they're told. We want to work in partnership in the spirit of openness with government bodies and politicians to bring out the best of our investment to everyone so that everyone can be excited about the future. But we must be able to move swif swiftly with few hurdles in the way. We are ready and willing to make that offer and invest huge amounts of money if the government is willing to listen and see what support they can provide too. We have the desire in this great country to help become a sustainable and exciting place to live, to work, to visit, and to engage in the 21st century. It might be an exaggeration to say uh, this could be a new era of enlightenment, but it could certainly be an exciting time for art, for debate, literature, not to mention food, drink, and hospitality. We all need to pull together to clear the way for innovators, investors, and those with a bright new thinking for the 21st century. Let's make Scotland a glowing beacon on the global stage. Thank you. So, thank you, Ewan. That thank was you. really interesting. Thank you for sharing your journey and your story with us. Um, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions from the audience, but I get to start. So my first question is, <laughs> are you willing to share the recipe for the tablet? And yeah, those that know me will know that I'm really interested in this. Well, if you... If you uh, so my plug back to you is that if you buy the Fortnum & Mason cookbook <laughs> under the dessert <laughs> section, then Ewan's tablet recipe is in the book. Fantastic. I will take that on board. <laughs> so, let me open the floor to any other questions. I do have some prepared. So, lady at the back, I'm going to go straight in. Sorry, could I just ask you to, if you press the button on the speaker, I should have said that at the beginning. That's it, yeah.
so, so inspired by your, your vision, the vision that you've set out, um, and um, the fact that you strive for partnership with investors, and the pace that you're eager to work, with, work at. Um, but I'm interested to know um, how, if you have any top tips on how you engage the local community and bring them on that journey with you. Top tips? Well, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, <laughs> good, good, great question. And I mean, I don't suppose we do it as well as we probably think we do or we want to do. But I mean, clearly through, you know, the, the, our, our, my team locally, uh, um, both they and I, you know, engage with the parish council meetings, with the local councillors, with the, the local groups at all stages of the process to try and engender that spirit of enthusiasm. And it is grassroots, uh, in a way, um, agreeing to come to speak tonight is a way of engagement. <laughs> um, the use of social media is a way of engagement. So, you know, I think it's just multifaceted, really. And, you know, the one thing that I am certain is that you think you're doing a good job communicating, and you never are. You've just got to try and try and try again. And, um, and, and people, of course, are resistant to change, and uh, so I alluded to that in my formal remarks. And, and that's understandable. And, and just because people are resistant to change didn't mean to say they're bad people at all. It's just that change is difficult, change is hard. And you know, in running businesses, I know that only too well. So um, you know, I think it's just repeat, repeat, repeat. <laughs> uh, uh, never, never, uh, n never give up on the, the energy of, of, of local, local communication, uh, getting local uh, people uh, informed, if not on side. And, and getting your message out there. Um, but it is, hard, it is hard, and, and, uh, and I don't know that we do it always that well, but we have very clear, genuine intent to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Lady next door. Thank you. Am I on? Yes, if okay. the little light goes on. Um, yeah. I actually live in Braemar, and I'm, I'm the local councillor. And one of the things that Ewan didn't tell us that um, Hauser and Worth have done for the village is they've built, at no cost to the community, two tennis courts. And this has brought a level of sport to the village for our young people who now have lessons that they have never had before. They've never had that opportunity. We haven't had tennis court in the village for the 30 years I've lived there. And I think that's one way, and I think it's interesting that he didn't say that, but it's one way that the, um, the business has engaged with the community and it's offering opportunity to um, the young people and the community as a whole. Well, that's very kind of you to say. And, and um, actually, as you've just said, uh, young and old, I mean, we're always guilty of sometimes talking about young all the time, uh, which I apologise for, because I don't think it's just about an age. You know, it's a, I think age is a mindset uh, and it's only a number. So young and, and old. I mean, the fact is that everybody uh, in the working world is, is typically working longer anyway. But yeah, I mean, that's great. And I mean, I think that thanks, thank you very much for saying that. The, the Tennis Court project is a good example of that. Um, but, I, I, but also, you know, just to pick up on the engagement point again, I think that the creation of the festivals, you know, the Braemar Summit that I referred to and the Literary Festival is also another way of engaging because you're creating a conversation. Now, it might not be about the direct business, but, but you are a, you're creating a community of people from, and, and the Literary Festival in particular was deeply motivational because at some of the talks we had you know, up to 200 people there. And there weren't just local people, there were people from Aberdeen, there were people from Perth, there were people from Edinburgh who had traveled to want to be in the community of Brimar. And, um, and I felt, you know, thought, well, that was really wow. Uh, and and, to, and that, that formal conversation through those talks, but also the, 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 the side conversations, I think, are a great way of, of, um, of identifying, you know, what, what, what's going on in the area. I and mean, that's great. So if we pick up on the entrepreneurial bit that you were talking about mm. earlier as well, what do you think, what would your advice be? We've got some... We have got some youngsters in the audience who are hopefully thinking about becoming entrepreneurs in the future. So <laughs> what, what would your advice to them be? Well, I do think it's about passion, you know, and being authentic. And, you know, the fact is that I was, I was sort of, my mother had me applying to Harriet Watt. Uh, uh, and, you know, and of course I sort of went along with the paperwork and sort of got so far. But, but you know, as I hope it came across, I, 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 there was an inner thing in me that was, there was an inner hunger that kind of wanted to get into the workplace. And, and 
Um, I have two daughters now who, you know, both just assume that they're going to university and that's great and I don't want to dissuade them of that and I sincerely believe they will and, and hope they do. Um, so I'm in no way, you know, in any way anti, you know, further higher education. I think it's, it's, it has its role to play. Good to it's, also, it's, also, yeah, thank you. it's also true, though, I think it's fair to say that, you know, there's too many people who have gone to, on to higher education who perhaps shouldn't have been there. And there has been, a, there was a, a decade or, or more where I think that happened. Uh, and, and so then people get a shock when they go into the workplace and they've got, you know, a 2-1 and something, and it's kind of like, well, how relevant is it for them? So, you know, I think that uh, entrepreneurship is about passion and belief, and if you are passionate and you believe in it, then go for it. And that could be go for it in education, further education, go for it in business, go for it in the charity sector, but whatever you feel about it, feel passionate and feel authentic. Other questions? So, John? Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm John uh, Scotton from uh, the Business School uh, Economics. Um, I guess there were, um, the, you know, at, at the heart of uh, your, your speech, there's this idea of uh, a philanthropic philosophy of your organization. I was wondering if you could kind of maybe um, talk a little bit more about what market value you think it has in relation to customers, but also maybe about motivation of staff? Well, you know, thank you for the question. I think that if we talk about the art business primarily here, uh, and, and I think it just then flows into the hospitality side, but, you know, our, our passion is our artists. You know, I talked about our people. Well, our people include our artists. And the work of our artists is the most important thing. And we allow, we encourage, we support our artists to be as, uh, un as, 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 as creative as they possibly can be and work with our artists to allow them environments to express themselves. One of the reasons we have so many galleries around the world is that each gallery is very, very different in the look and feel. And often an artist will respond to a space that will create a body of work that they might be prepared to do in Menorca, but they'd never do in New York. So, in a sense, uh, to answer your question, it, it all starts, you know, that philanthropic approach really almost starts from the very thing that we sell, that we make our profit from. But it does, never comes from a point of view of saying to an artist, we need you to paint 10 paintings for that art exhibition, which incidentally goes on in the trade. There are gallerists who will say to an artist, we've got a fair coming up, we need 14 slots and we've got 14 paintings you've got to produce. Well, then you, you wonder why so much, well, not so much, but you wonder why sometimes not so good art appears at, 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 in exhibitions or in, in fairs. So, you know, because of our belief that everything we do is about the artist and about the right, if it's good for the artist, it's good for our organisation. So none of that comes from a drive to make profit it's all from a drive about quality of work. And if you get the quality of work, you create the right environment, you storytell in the right way, then of course the work will be sold and profit will be made and the returns will be there. And, and, and in hospitality, I've always been brought up with this idea about generosity. Hospitality by its very word is about generosity of spirit. So if you go, if you come into one of our establishments and, 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 and you know, the thing that you want to be made, feel, made to feel from the off go is there's, there's a warmth, there's a generosity of spirit, there's a warmth, there's a welcome, there's a greeting. And then when it comes to the product, that, that things aren't measured out in milliliters, that there's a, there's, a, there's a spirit, there's a generosity of how things are presented and how food's presented and the, and the follow-on and the conversation. So, uh, I mean... Again, that's not a profit-driven approach to doing business. But if you do those things well, then profit will, will come. And, and uh, in retail, I used to talk, when I was running the shops, I used to talk about the five Ps. And we used to talk about people and product and process and property. And if we did the four things right, then profit would follow. And I, and I see that not in that same organised, structured way in art, but in art and hospitality, it's don't focus on the profit, focus on the product, the creative process, and that will generate. 
And, and against that background, um, I, I, we have a, you know, a firm belief in learning in the education process. I mean, we have you know, 200, almost 200,000 people of every age, every background in our galleries engaging in some form of learning program, be it in the physical location or on digital. All of that's completely free of charge. You know, we, we, we have, uh, we have a, a, an institute in America that's investing uh, in, in, in academia and in research papers in, in, in the, 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 the uh, what's the word, the, you know, uh, logging and, and, and you know, um, referencing of the history of certain, of certain artists and the, their back catalogue and what role that they play. So um, all of that's done, again, without direct commercial benefit, but what it does do among serious collectors is gives you a credence, a respect, a, 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 an appreciation that we are serious people and we are, we are custodians of a collection of artists and their work. Louise Bourgeois, uh, who was represented by the gallery in life and, and now in death, her estate is represented by the gallery, is probably one of the, the, probably the most significant female artists of the 20th century. You know, our job every day is to protect her legacy, is to make sure that her story is documented, is understood, and is there for future generations to go forward. Tracy Emin, a household name, I think, in the United Kingdom, would say that, you know, without Louise Bourgeois, she would never have become an artist. In, in common, probably, with everybody in the hospitality industry, um, training, uh, or recruiting, training, and retaining staff is a huge issue. Uh, how do you go about it, and uh, how successful has it been in, in Braemar? <laughs> well, they, thank you for the question. The, the, the uh, number one issue, I think, is there's just there are a severe lack of people to even recruit and train <laughs> at the moment, and in the hospitality sector, and in, in, indeed in a number of other sectors, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges of any recovery that, the, that, that our, our collective governments have, have to lead us out of is, is, is how, do we, uh, how do we enable a more fluid workforce across the, across the United Kingdom from wherever in the world uh, and from within the United Kingdom to help us, uh, first of all, have a pool of people to try and recruit and then train and then re retain. Look, it's the magic. I've got some extraordinary people who are here in the audience who, who work in Brimar. Uh, our general manager, Helen's here, Lorraine's here, a number of the team are here, who are just blooming good people at their jobs. They're deeply professional, and they are passionate about uh, looking after people and making sure that we give them great opportunities. One specific issue here in Brimar, in the Highlands, is, of course, accommodation. Uh, half of our workforce are people who uh, live, uh, uh, live in the area, they, they're born in the area, they live in the area, but the other half of the workforce, which is about 70 or 80 people, are from other parts of the UK or further afield, and we have to find accommodation for them. And, and we've done that, and we've invested heavily in, in acquiring properties to, to put people up in. But the, 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 the downside of that, and we've discussed this before <laughs> tonight, is that, of course, puts pressure on house prices because, you know, we go in and buy property and then property values go up and then local people get cross with us because suddenly property prices are 20% higher because we're buying anything that's available to buy. So, you know, it doesn't make us popular. But on the other hand, uh, without accommodation, we can't hire the people and, and then we can't provide the service. So it's a complicated jigsaw. And, uh, and, I, and so, so, so I think it is about, you know, having good people to do the training, to do the support, to pay the right pay rates. Uh, but accommodation in rural economies, I think, is one of the biggest single challenges. And then that brings me back to my sort of open plea about infrastructure. And I touched a little bit on it with transport, you know, but, but we've got to get real with transport. We can't just rely on people with cars. In fact, more and more younger people are not, simply not taking up driving because the cost of cars, the cost of insurance, the cost of fuel is so expensive that it's prohibitive for them to be able to, 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 to drive into remote locations. So public transport is an essential thing. 
Now, one of the things we've done to combat it in the, in the short term is we've created our own bus system. So we have our own Five Arms bus that goes out and picks people up on a sort of milk round tour and brings them into the village. And that's gone down, I think, rather well. And it's made people's lives feel a bit easier. It's made them feel safer. Because if you finish the shift at 11 p.m. at night and you're wake, waiting for the, the bus to, to Aboyne, you know, it's not such a joyful thing to do if you're, uh, especially if you're perhaps a, a young woman, you know, and, and, and you know, it's not for all, all the obvious reasons. So, so um, we've had to get on and do stuff. But I do think that that's part of the, uh, the, the nugget that needs to be unlocked is, is the infrastructure and transport's one of those things. Hi, so I'm, my name's Alex and I'm the president of the Economics Business Society here at the University of Aberdeen. And first of all, I want to say how inspiring your speech was and think something from what my members of the society normally ask people is who would be your, so you're an inspiring man and Prefer, I would presume there was somebody there that inspired you to go all beyond the field. So who is your inspiring person and why? Thank you for, thank you for the, the compliment, but also thank you for the question. Um, well, I, you know, my, my parents were, you know, a huge inspiration in their behaviours. They, they were, my father was in the... Uh, um, Merchant Navy and travelled the world. My mother was in medicine. She was a radiographer. Um, she became, I think, Scotland's, one of Scotland's very first ultrasonographers at the age of 50. So she retrained in her late 40s, early 50s, and she was a very early ultrasonographer. And they both in their youth travelled. You know, they travelled the world and they worked all over the world. And, and so I suppose um, without... You know, it's not, very, it's, not, it's not a glamorous answer for you, but it's a very truthful answer. I was sort of deeply inspired by how they, um, uh, th their youth and, and how their attitudes were. And, and, and hence why, you know, going to London when I was from the, with my brother, you know, from the age of sort of five or six, you know, for all those early formative years and going to the theatre, you know, that, that, that created this inspiration for me. Um, so it wasn't so much a, a single entrepreneur or a single leader that, that made me go, wow, I, they are, they are my inspiration. It was really my, my parents that gave me that drive. And, and then I think London as a capital city um, gave me an energy that I was, I, I got quite addicted to and, and felt quite, quite good about. I was asked in an interview just very recently, um, who's the person I admire the most, but this is a very recent, uh, you know, uh, question and a very recent answer. And I, um, I, and my response was Dame Judi Dench, and, and, I, and, and, and I think, you know, she's a sort of treasure to all of us, isn't she, really? Uh, but, but for one single reason is that this lady's in her 80 or 4 or 85 or something, and still working, and still mentally agile, and, and has no intentions of ever giving up, because she said, the minute I give up, I'll die. And so I suppose I'm, I'm I, as, a, as someone who I would uh, look up to today, I'd say Judy is a good example of someone who I respect for her work ethic, for her approach and for her energy and wit. Thank you. <laughs> Hiya, thank you very much for your talk today. Um, I was wondering, what methods have you put in place to lower your carbon footprint to reach the goal of 50%? So the, the um, uh, several lots of initiatives running. So um, we've we've created a what we call the sort of green team structure within our organisation. So at each local gallery, we have um, small groups of people who like look at all of the local actions to see what we can do, and and I think that's a great sort of underpinning uh, attitude towards uh, achieving uh, towards achieving that goal. But on a on a much uh, more uh, wide bigger scale. Um, and sorry, I'm within that local teamwork, a lot of that is dealing with housekeeping around lighting, uh, you know, LEDs, timing of uh, switches of, you know, lights going on and off and energy saving uh, techniques at a local level, which actually does have quite a big impact. But on a, on a sort of more macro level in the exhibitions of our gallery, it's planning where, how our work, um, the works of art, 
where the works come from, uh, can we ship rather than fly? So with sculpture, for example, you know, heavier weight to items, it's clearly has a much less uh, carbon impact by shipping rather than, so you've got to plan better, you've got to plan further in advance. We've done a, a huge exercise with our packaging. So there's a lot of new technologies of lighter, uh, more robust packaging rather than wooden crates, which uh, again allows for uh, uh, gains in, in weight, which has a direct impact on your, your carbon footprint. We're traveling less, so we're being more economical with um, how we send our artist liaison teams, our tech teams, our sales people around the world. So not everybody feels the need to go to every single exhibition or every single uh, fair. So we've taken a fundamental uh, reduction in, uh, in our approach to traveling. Um, we've engaged with our artists. So there's a lot more conversations on use of materials, uh, especially in sculpture. So uh, people are starting to reflect much more on Concrete is a bit of a no-no now, you know, whereas concrete would be used a lot in sculpture, but as we know, it's not, uh, not uh, one, of the bad, one of the bad materials. Um, and then looking in our hospitality side, one of the, the great sort of threads of our strategy around the properties that we develop are often traditional old buildings. And so uh, the use of the, the reusability, the reusing of materials that we find is, uh, that we handle is one of the best ways of reducing your footprint. I was staggered by a statistic that in the United States, 55 billion square foot of office space is built every year in the US. So people are building buildings for 20 years. Who's building buildings for a thousand years today? Well, the Fife Arms is 150 years old or something, and we've lovingly restored it that I think it should be in great nick for another 100 years or more without too much attention. So, you know, our, I believe that our job with our architects on the hospitality side is to reuse and recycle and repurpose as much as possible in the works that we do and to make sure that we are playing our role at building buildings that last 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, and not buildings with shelf lives of 20 and 30 years. That, by the way, if the architectural world and the building world and the construction world could get to grips with that conundrum, would have a dramatic impact on uh, carbon. Slightly longer answer than you wanted, probably, but uh, I hope it gives you a, a fuller extent. Uh, uh, just one final point. Everybody's focused too much on air, traffic, air travel, which uh, accounts for less than 2% of the world's emissions. It's an important thing to be focused on, but it is only under 2%. It's not the biggest polluter. Uh, there are other bigger challenges to be focused on. So. so can I follow up on that? I noticed the 50% yeah. and you're a third of yeah. the way there, which is fantastic. But do you now reflect that the 50% is maybe not challenging enough? Oh, totally, of course, 100%. I mean, I mean you, we've got to get to... I mean, you, it's impossible to say we'll be... The 50% is a real reduction, however. It's not to do, nothing to do with offsetting. So, I mean, I can tell you now we offset enough to be yeah. carbon neutral, but that, as we all know, that's an easy way out. Um, no, we have to push ourselves more. But it is difficult, as I alluded to. It's just not an easy thing to say and do. And, and as we know, governments around the world are struggling now with this even, even more so. So I believe we will deliver our genuine 50% reduction by 2030, but we need to push ourselves beyond that. And I think we, um, and we certainly need to invest in other offset methodologies that, that are meaningful you know, are, and that are not just greenwashing. Because I believe that consumers like you and your generation will completely uh, uh, disengage with brands and organisations that uh, don't treat this seriously in the future. Okay. Time for one more question. Thank you. Thank you, Ewan. Um, what would you say are the two biggest business challenges facing you for the next two to three years, given the upheaval that we've come through economically and we're not through it, the people challenges you've spoken about, what are the two biggest that you face? Um, I think uh, the, the two, two things, one is people, um, uh, uh, recruitment, um, uh, for the reasons we've patched, touched on already, and I think that, that uh, availability of labour, um, both in this country but also in other territories that we operate in. 
because that's the unique. It's, it's, you know, the, the, it's not just the B word. You know, it's not just Brexit. You know, the, the world is. I don't know where all the people have gone, but they've all disappeared somewhere because the, because every country seems to be having shortages. Of, so goodness knows, uh, there must be an awful lot of people who've decided not to work. Uh, so people uh, and availability of labour, I think, is uh, number one. And number two is uncertainty, because uncertainty breeds a uh, uh, declining consumption. And, uh, and whether people have money or not, no money, because, uh, you know, you can, we can all feel less well-off or well-off, depending on, you know, where we are in life, yeah? But, but that uncertainty uh, kills consumption. And then you become a spiral, you know, then it becomes a spiral of, of, of decline. And, and, uh, and, and, and that's, that's one of the biggest dangers, I think, to, to our economies of the world is uncertainty. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, let's have one more. Is that okay? Yeah, I don't mind. <laughs> one more. Um, it's a very quick question. It's yes or no. Um, how many people are in charge of a local recruitment company? I think we have successfully... Um, uh, supplied the Fife with, with personnel, so I'm delighted to say that. Um, we've also run an art competition for the last 15 years where we've asked S1 and S2 pupils to draw what they want to be when they grow up, so that to, to draw and describe their aspirational self. Unfortunately, we, the judging happened last week, but I wondered if you'd be a judge next year. Yeah. Just yes or no yes. would be yes. fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. So thank you very much, Ewan. It's been really, really interesting. The photographs were wonderful. It's, it, it reminds us what a beautiful area we live in as well. Mm. So thank you very much from the audience. Thank you very much from the university as well. Thank you also to the audience for, for turning up. I'm so glad that last night wasn't tonight, as in terms of the weather, and that it's so much nicer. But it's lovely to see everybody, and we really look forward to seeing you at the next one of our events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.